Okay, so in this uh, final video belonging to lecture one, I want to start introducing some of the vocabulary we'll need uh, to, start, to start discussing the correctness of consensus protocols, which we'll study in earnest beginning next lecture in lecture two. So in this lecture series, we'll see a few different notions of consensus, probably at least three different problems of consensus. Uh, here I want to start with the one that's most immediately relevant in a blockchain context, uh, which is known as the SMR or state machine replication problem. Now, if you're thinking that state machine replication sounds like a kind of old school name, you'd be right. It was definitely uh, studied as early as the 1980s. And in fact, you know, as we'll see, um, you know, computer scientists in the 1980s had a very different motivation for defining this problem than we're going to have in a blockchain context. And it kind of actually blows me away <laughs> that, uh, that this problem definition, you know, which preceded blockchains by, you know, 25 plus years uh, is so immediately relevant. Honestly, I think it sort of speaks to the power of abstraction and the power of sort of theoretical work, where if you really tease out the essence of what makes a problem hard, good chance that, you know, many decades later, there's going to be a new technology where the essential difficulty of it will again be the same as the one you identified uh, many decades before. All right, so what does state machine replication refer to? Uh, well, let's take it in two steps. Let's talk about state machines and talk about replication. Uh, so state machine, you know, you should think here just about like if you've ever studied, you know, finite automata, you know, that's the kind of thing you should be thinking about. You should be thinking of, you know, there's a bunch of different states that a machine could be in, you know, and whenever it kind of processes a message or whenever it executes an instruction, there's potentially a straight state transition. So it goes from one state to another state. You know, a canonical example of the 1980s would be you're working with a database okay? and you can think of a database as sort of a state machine where the possible states are the possible contents of the database and whenever for example someone does a write or an insert to the database that's going to be a state transition because it changes you know the state of the database so in a blockchain context you know for concreteness you could think about the state encoding uh, you know the current balance in the native cryptocurrency of all of the users of that blockchain um, as we'll see, you know, for a lot of blockchain, state will be something more general than that. But that would be a concrete example of what state would mean uh, for us. Just, you know, account balances. And then obviously, whenever anyone makes a payment, transfers some currency, that's going to change the states. That's going to be a state transition. And so the little cartoons that, you know, you often study when you study finite automata is, you know, you write down a bunch of circles, so vertices of a graph, which correspond to states. Then you have a direct, directed edges which correspond to state transitions. And maybe you label those edges with the sort of conditions under which you make that state transition, like receiving a particular message, um, you know, or you know, some other kind of event. So that's the state machine part of SMR. So what about the, the replication part? Well, let me again sort of tell, tell you the kinds of things they had in mind in the 1980s when they coined this term. And let's again use the database uh, example. So imagine, you know, maybe you're a big company or, you know, you're IBM or something like this, and you have some database that some customers of yours, um, you'd like them to be able to use it. So they can issue queries to the database. Maybe they can even insert stuff into the database, whatever. And imagine you actually want to provide them with super high uptime, very close to 100%, you know, 99.999% uptime. You're not going to be able to achieve that uptime with just sort of a single machine running the database, okay? Because machines, you know, fail with some probability that's bigger than 0.001%. So a natural way to boost the uptime would be to have replicas of the database, multiple copies. They're all the same. Uh, the point is just that, you know, when one of the copies crashes, you know, maybe there's sort of a hurricane, you know, you have a different server in a different part of the world, uh, which, you can route, which you can route clients' requests to instead. So replicating something with the goal of higher uptime, that's a very natural idea. Of course, you know, as soon as you have multiple copies that are supposed to be in sync, you've got a consensus problem, right? You really want from the, from the customer perspective, from the client perspective, you want it to be logically as if there was just one copy of the database. So it better not be the case that like if you ask copy number one, you get one answer and you ask copy number two, you get a different answer, right? That would be a total disaster. That means you're really not uh, simulating a single database if the answer depends on who you ask. Okay. So that, that was their state machines, you know, databases. That was one, one example of, of what they had in mind with a state machine uh, and what they had in mind for replication. Now, in a blockchain context, you know, rep replication does help with uptime, but there's another completely different goal. 
of replication in, in, in permissionless blockchains, which is sort of decentralization, something I'll leave safely undefined. You know, but remember, I said the functionality we're looking for is a big programmable computer in the sky, you know, which is not operated by any one entity. It's really operated by thousands or tens of thousands of nodes, uh, and you can be one of those nodes if you want. So that's replication. So all of these nodes running the protocol, they will all be replicating the same sequence of instructions. And it's so that none of them is a sole owner of the state and of the computation that's being done on that state. So again, I think it's kind of amazing that basically the same formalism is equally relevant both to sort of an old school problem like replicating a database and the new school problem like uh, you know running a permissionless blockchain. Very cool. All right, so let me tell you what the SMR problem actually is. So I want to distinguish between two types of parties. Okay, so first of all, we're going to have nodes who are actually sort of running a protocol that actually want to stay in sync with each other. But then there's also going to be clients or customers or users. Okay, so these are entities that aren't necessarily running the protocol. They're not necessarily running the node, but they'd like to either sort of read the state or change the state in some way. And so again, in the database context, this would just be a database customer who's sort of issuing a read or write to the database. In a blockchain context, this would be just a user of a blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum issuing a transaction, for example, a payment from themselves to somebody else. So in a blockchain context, the messages that clients send to the nodes running the protocol, I'm gonna to refer to them as transactions. Uh, for concreteness, you can think of a transaction as a currency transfer from you know, one party to another party. You know, in more general smart contract platforms, potentially a transaction represents something much more complicated. Uh, like for example, uh, a function call to a smart contract, which then might in turn launch a bunch of different function calls to other smart contracts, uh, et cetera. Okay, so we're gonna refer that to as a transaction. That is a message being sent from the client to one or more of the nodes running the protocol. So what are the nodes responsible for doing? Well, each of them is going to maintain locally uh, an append only data structure. Okay, so a data structure that you can stick stuff up at the end, but you can never take stuff, you can never delete from. And what gets stored in this data structure are transactions that have been submitted previously uh, by clients. So in effect, each node is maintaining locally uh, an ordered sequence of transactions. Notice that I will sometimes abbreviate transaction by TX and transactions by TXS. Append-only data structure is kind of a mouthful, so I will just call each of these things a history for short. So each node is going to have its own local history, which represents an ordered sequence of transactions. It's very common that you'll hear people call what I'm calling a history. People will call it a ledger. Uh, I'm going to stay away from the word ledger because to me it too strongly connotes uh, payments. And as, as I said earlier, for us, blockchains are not really about payments per se. That's kind of a very uh, narrow use case. We're going to be interested in much more general functionality, so I'll use this much more generic term of just a history to mean a sequence of an ordered sequence of transactions. And so now, what what would we like to see happen? We would like to see all of these nodes have identical local histories. That's what we mean by keeping them in sync. And remember, fundamentally, consensus means keeping a bunch of different uh, nodes in sync, despite potentially failures, delays, and attacks. One thing to notice is I keep talking about the ordered sequence of transactions. I talk about histories as ordered lists. And notice, if you think about the applications I just told you about, the order is really important, right? That was already true in the database example, right? If you have like two different clients submit conflicting rights, rights to the same variable, uh, it really matters which of them gets uh, executed first and which of them gets executed second. And it's even starker in the blockchain context, right? Because maybe you have sort of two different transactions you know, one spends a coin and gives it to Alice, the other one sends that exact same coin to Bob, then obviously the order in which those transactions are executed matters a lot. Whichever one comes first will actually get the transfer of the coin. Whichever one comes second will fail because that coin will have already been spent. So very important that all of the, all of the nodes, all of the histories, they're an ordered sequence uh, of transactions. All right, so that's informally the problem. Right, so clients are sort of sending transactions to these nodes. We want to keep the nodes in sync, meaning they should have uh, identical local histories, local orders of transactions. Now, what would a solution to the SMR protocol, what, what form would it take? Well, it's going to take the form of a, a protocol. 
I'm not going to burden you with an overly formal definition of a protocol, especially because we're about to see zillions of examples in the next four lectures or so, so it'll be very clear uh, over time what I mean by a protocol. But let me just give you kind of a very, um, just to sort of orient you, give you a sort of very high-level description of what I mean by a protocol. So a protocol, it's really just going to be a piece of code, okay, that each of the nodes runs locally. And you should think of it as sort of event-driven code. Right? So there's going to be basically a bunch of functions, and it's sort of like when one event happens, that will trigger one of those functions, which will then do some stuff. Okay? So what kind of stuff might a node do in response to some event? An event here being like maybe you sort of receive a message from a different node, maybe you receive a new transaction from client. Well, in response to some, an event like that, receiving a message, you, know, you might want to sort of do something with your local state. You know, maybe you add a new transaction to the end of your history. Uh, or you may want to send some messages yourself, like you may want to compare notes with your fellow full nodes. So that's the way you should think about life in the day of a node who's running a protocol, right? I mean, you're receiving messages both from other nodes and from clients. Um, you're potentially sending messages out to other full nodes in response. You're generally not sending messages to clients. You're going to be sending messages to other, other nodes. Um, and you might be doing local computation sort of on top of that. So that's what a potential solution to the SMR problem looks like. It looks like a piece of code. It looks like a protocol. Okay, so instructions for what each node is supposed to do as it receives messages and as the results of its local computations. All right, so next, now given such a protocol, when should we say that it solves the SMR problem? Like, what does it mean? You know, I noticed, I mean, this question is, is, is a lot harder to answer for sort of a distributed protocol that runs forever than it is to say, you know, Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm, right? If you have, if you have an algorithm that's just going to be run once on one input, right? It's kind of like, well, the algorithm either returns the shortest path or it doesn't, right? So it's either correct or it's not, right? Whereas these protocols, they're sort of running forever. And it's not like there's some single output at the end. So we need to think a little harder about what it means to correctly solve uh, a consensus problem like SMR. All right, so let's be a little more formal about what we want, okay? What, what's required uh, to be deemed a solution to the SMR problem. So generally, you know, distributed protocols like this, one talks about uh, liveness properties and safety properties. And liveness properties have the form, something good eventually happens, right? And so for different things you might want to have happen, you get different liveness properties. Uh, safety says that, you know, bad things never happen. And again, you can have different types of safety properties depending on which bad events you're looking at. And so here we're going to have um, one liveness property and one safety property. Let's start with a safety property, which we're going to call consistency. And consistency is really just what we've been talking about, you know, all along. Keeping the nodes in sync, meaning that their local histories should match up. In fact, we're going to be satisfied with something a little weaker than that. We're not going to insist that all of the machines sort of add transactions to their histories 100% in lockstep. Right? Because remember, I mean, these nodes are potentially scattered all over the globe. There might be a node like in Siberia that just, you know, gets messages much later than anybody else. So we want to allow that some machine might lag behind. Okay? And if we wait a while, it's going to catch up. But in any given snapshot in time, it might be a little bit behind the other. So we're going to be fine with that as long as the laggard's history is a prefix of the history of everybody else. Okay. So for, more formally, for any pair of nodes, it should be the case that either they have identical histories or one of them should have a history that's a prefix of the other one. So the thing which is really never okay, okay, the stuff that we never want to have happen, is that two different nodes order a pair of transactions in opposite ways. Okay, that's the bad event we want to make sure never happens. Okay, so that's, uh, that's why this is a safety property uh, and we're calling it consistency. Now, if the only thing we cared about was consistency in this sense, consensus or SMR would not be a hard problem. Want to know a really easy way to make sure that all of the nodes always have the same history? Never add anything to anybody's history. <laughs> literally do nothing okay all the nodes will always have the empty sequence and will always be in sync obviously that's not what we have in mind so we need to impose another constraint on the protocol to qualify as a solution and this is going to be the liveness property uh, so we're going to just want to say that you know transactions that are submitted by clients 
eligible to be added should eventually be added. So when there's work to be done, the nodes actually should do it. So the word valid here in, in the liveness definition, I mean, that depends a little bit on the details of the blockchain that you're talking about. But, you know, you can think of things like, you know, it should be, you know, digitally signed by the sender. If it's a currency transfer, there should be sufficient currency in that user's account, uh, etc. Okay, so that's what I mean by any transaction which is sort of eligible for inclusion. Like it is a sensible thing you could add. Anything that's valid in that sense should eventually get added uh, by some node, which then by consistency means it's going to get added by all of the nodes. Of course, one might like an even stronger version of liveness. You might like concrete bounds on how long it takes a message to be added. Um, and we will probably see some examples of that uh, later in the lecture series. All right, so this is, a, this is a nice milestone. We've specified what it is we want, at least for now, what it is we want. Okay, we want to solve the state machine replication problem. And by solve, we mean we want a protocol that satisfies both the consistency uh, condition, so all of the nodes in sync, you know, maybe some are lagging behind, but there's never any disagreements over the orders of transactions. Uh, and that's also live. Okay, so that also does work whenever there's work to be done. So the question now is, right? I mean, anyone can make a definition, but it's not a foregone conclusion that there's anything that satisfies the definitions. So you should be asking the question, like, is there or is there not a protocol that solves SMR in this sense, okay? That is live and is consistent. And what we're going to see over the next four or so lectures is the answer to that question, okay? The possibility or impossibility of SMR protocols will depend on the assumptions that we make. There are two main types of assumptions that govern whether or not there exist consensus protocols with these two properties. One genre of assumptions is about the underlying communication network, to what extent there are delays or outages or denial of service attacks. So we'll need different models of sort of how reliable the communication network is. And then the other genre of assumptions, which is super important uh, to know if things are feasible or infeasible, uh, is how many of the nodes we can count on operating correctly. Okay, so staying up, executing the updated and correct version of the protocol, uh, and not being controlled by some adversary that wants to mess up the protocol. So we're going to see that under sufficiently strong assumptions about the network, uh, the communication network, and that there are sufficient bounds on the adversary's power, we will in fact be able to uh, solve the SMR problem in this sense with a protocol that is both live and consistent. So we'll look at our first result of that type in the next lecture, in lecture two. Uh, a famous protocol from the early 1980s by Dolov and Strong, which solves this problem uh, in the context of the synchronous network model, where you do not have kind of unbounded, unexpected delays. So that's coming up in lecture two. I look forward to seeing you there.